It's a pleasure to have GM CEO with us. Uh, thank you so much for coming to Signal, Mary. Well, it, it's great to be here, and so I look forward to our discussion. Absolutely. Let's start with the year that was. Uh, last year, uh, during the peak of the pandemic, just as everybody was you know, in the midst of figuring out this disruption, uh, GM worked with a number of partners to dramatically increase the production speed and capacity of a small ventilator company. Um, what lessons did you learn from uh, doing that so quickly? Well, uh, you know, as you go back to that period in time, what a time it was, and we were focused on keeping our employees safe and our customers safe. And when we saw that there was a need for, uh, for our country, you know, that's where General Motors has a really proud history. And so, you know, we, we assigned the team. Um, I got a call from Ken Chenault, who introduced me to Ventec. And within 30 days, we were producing um, the very first ventilator. And, and what I really learned is not, not only our GM employees, but also our suppliers, you know, they really uh, just sprang into action and really looked at how can we do something to help save lives. And, you know, when I look at the amount of work that people got done in a short period of time, knowing they had to do this work with quality, uh, with speed, um, it really, my biggest learning was give people a clear mission and get out of their way and they'll do amazing things. And like I said, not only the GM team and so many people were involved um, solving issues and, and finding solutions, but also the automotive supply base, because I think most people don't recognize uh, the ventilator that we were making had over 600 parts. 300 of those parts roughly came from brand a brand new supplier. Uh, so, you know, to get something tooled and built and ready so we could start building in 30 days was just um, incredible. And now at General Motors, we call it ventilator speed. Um, and we talk about we can we can go this fast and we can't do this on everything, but we can go fast um, and really move the company forward. Yeah, and I imagine that that ventilator speed, as you put it, uh, maybe top of mind across the whole company, uh, given the goals that you've set uh, for the company as it relates to a big issue we've been talking about all throughout Signal, which is climate change and sustainability. Um, under your leadership, uh, GM has become a, a climate leader. Um, you've committed to zero emission fleet by 2035. That used to seem like a long time from now, but it, you know it's just over a decade. Um, you know, one of the industry uh, uh, publications covering this called it the biggest swing ever by an American automaker. Um, how big a shift is this for you? Uh, and, and what does this pledge reflect for the business? Well, we have been committed to an all electric future, a zero emissions future for quite a while. And that's why I'm really excited because this fall, we're gonna be launching our first vehicle off of our Ultium platform, which is our electric vehicle platform. And so this started years ago um, because we recognized uh, the steps we needed to take and, and we've been on that journey. So uh, a lot of it was getting everybody on board and making sure everybody understood you know, this is critical and we're serious. And so that's what we've been doing over the last few years. And I'm really proud to see it start, you know, to really uh, turn into a reality as we launch the GMC Hummer EV later this fall. Uh, we do believe that this is going to help us establish a safer, a greener, and a better world for all. And, you know, we believe with the leadership position we've taken and put out there, uh, it's going to move others to move in, in this direction. But when you look at General Motors, we are a full line manufacturer. We sell more vehicles in the United States than anyone else. Um, we're number two in China. And if we can make sure that we change over the whole fleet and truly have an EV for everyone, we're going to make a faster transition to electric vehicles, which is going to be good for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, part of that, of course, has to do with the supply chain. Um, and you know, the, if the pandemic taught us anything uh, it's that the supply chain is far more important than many might have thought. Um, how did the pandemic impact the supply chain? I'm thinking in particular about the high tech uh, parts that that have you know impacted uh, manufacturing. And and what lessons do you carry forward as you go through this uh, uh, EV transition? 
Well, clearly, you know, what we're dealing with now is the semiconductor shortage, and it has really impacted the auto industry uh, across the globe. So, you know, right now in the near term, we have a cross-functional team, and I'm so proud of them because they're incredibly nimble and really looking at ways that we can build as many vehicles as we can because we're also seeing very strong uh, demand for vehicles, especially our full-size trucks, full-size crossovers. Uh, We're seeing growth in our, our Chevrolet Bolt EV and EUV that we've just launched. And so we're working just, you know, to be very nimble with every uh, chip we can get a hold of to to put it in our highest demand vehicles. And over the longer term, we're also looking at what shifts and changes do we need to make in our supply chain to have the the consistency? Because frankly, the, the number of chips that we need right now, we signaled to the supply base last fall, but I think because of all the issues uh, when people were still dealing with the pandemic that caused them to make supply decisions. So we're working in a much different way, deeper in the supply base. And again, we'll look at it longer term, uh, working with uh, the US government as well to find the right solutions uh, to make sure that we're never constrained like this with semiconductors and actually take those lessons learned across many components that we're going to need as we shift to electric vehicles. Yeah. You know, as I think about that shift and, and, you know, the alignment now that you see with, uh, you know, the current administration around climate change, as well as it seems overall, you know, the society and, you know, voter polls seem to be quite supportive of, of climate change, you know, of addressing climate change. That was not always the case. Um, and, you know, as a CEO, you've, uh, with, as with many CEOs, this is one of the pillars of Signal this year, which uh, we're calling corporate citizenship, really an exploration of the role of the corporation in society. Um, it's certainly true that, you know, companies are being expected to have a point of view or to stand up on certain issues. Uh, you've joined uh, notable CEOs uh, in opposing voter uh, uh, restriction legislation. Um, That's one of many social issues uh, that you and the company have taken a stand on. And it seems, uh, you know, I'm asking you, maybe with a little bit of empathy, that you're sort of in a no-win situation. You you sell cars to everybody, um, but everybody has a point of view about politics. How do you thread that needle as a corporation and a leader? Well, at General Motors, it starts with our values, and we want to live our values and our behaviors. And, you know, we've been very public about our commitment and our aspiration to be the most inclusive company in the world. So as issues face the globe or our country, we look at, is it something that we need? We think we need to share? And, and a lot of times when we talk about something, we're really talking to our employees because employees today want to work for a company that aligns with their values and, and agrees with what is important. And we know, um, you know there's, there's diversity of thought on many of these issues. So what we, what we work hard to do is, is really link it to our values. And so as it um, uh, relates to voting, we simply said that you know, we want to make sure that for all eligible voters that their voices are included in a, a fair, free, and equitable manner and, and to make sure that um, we protect, you know, what is really the essence of a democratic society. And, you know, when you talk about protecting or enhancing someone's voting rights, um, you know, most people don't disagree with that. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of times the biggest challenge is making sure what you're actually saying is heard as opposed to the way others, you know, other people may want to twist it for their own specific agenda. So we find it helpful many times to be able to talk to our employees so they know exactly what we believe. Uh, and uh, and then we listen because, you know, sometimes we get different points of view and, and that helps make makes, you know, our thinking richer and, you know, can can move us forward. Uh, I just want to ask a, a, a kind of a second beat on on that question, because it, it's so interesting to me and, and it's been so many speakers that Signal ha- have addressed it. Um, but the, the the role of the company in actually taking a stand um, is, you know, has evolved dramatically. Um, we've seen that with Procter & Gamble, host of this conference, uh, in taking stands on issues of race, uh, of gender equality, uh, and, and much more. Um, you know, over your tenure, uh, do you agree that this has become more and more of an issue? And, and do you see that as 
as continuing, or do you think maybe we're going to get to a point where where you know <laughs> most of the issues have been addressed and 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 it conti- and we move back to business? Um, I don't really see. I don't see it changing. I think. Um, I think that the the uh, thing that companies have to look at or how we look at it at GM is we're not going to speak out on everything. We're really going to speak out of the things that we think we can make a difference or our employees need to understand where we stand as we try to be inclusive and welcome, uh, you know, all, all everyone's views. And so I think that, but I think uh, it's, it's something that is uh, not going to change. And so uh, our employees understanding when we're going to speak as well as when we're not and why I think is what we're working to establish. But, but I think the, this is, I, I can't see all the issues being uh, being captured and moving on. And actually, I think in a way this is business because when you look at how important it is to get uh, the right employees and to have them believe in the company, I, I think this is just a, an expectation now that our employees have. Um, it's more than just the parts we make and the customers we serve. It's the way in which we do it and what we believe in. So I, I think it's a permanent change. Right. Uh, and th- now, you know, related to this, th- to this is uh, something that you went through both personally and as a co- and the company went through uh, on the issue of race and diversity. It's been center stage since last May, uh, and uh, you were called out uh, by a prominent group of black media owners um, for not supporting their work. Um, I know that that's it's a difficult question to ask, but it has to do with media and marketing, another big theme of this conference. I'm sure everyone in the audience would like to understand what you took away from that experience and your thoughts on on the role of business in this issue. Well, you know, as I mentioned, that we aspire to be the most inclusive company in the world. And so we're on a journey. And anytime you receive praise or criticism, I think you need to step back and object, objectively ask, how can I be better? What can I learn? Why does someone have this perception? So as we specifically looked at our diverse media spend and specifically black media spend, we recognized we could be better. So we started with listening. And I personally participated in eight sessions with uh, different companies and with the question of being, how can we be better? And we listened, we made the changes they suggested. Uh, and I think we're a better company for it. We also set a goal that by 2025, we want 8% of our ad spend to be with black owned media. And um, I think overall that was really well received um, by the people that we talked to. We also then did a media summit, summit which was part of our process change. And I think, you know, we're gonna be a better company for it. So, um, you know, anytime you're on a journey, you have to listen to criticism and you have to learn from it and, and, you know, be better. Uh, if everything was perfect right now, we'd be the most inclusive company. So clearly, you know, I think we have work to do. So we're going to continue to listen and learn. Oh. Um, one of the things that uh, you've been, you know, uh, heralded for, um, you know, was not something that was your own choice. You are a woman. Uh, you are one of 41 women, 41 women in the Fortune 500 women CEOs. Um, that's, you know, uh, just uh, well under 10 percent, I should say. Um, you know, you're one of the most visible in that group. Can you reflect on the progress being made when it comes to uh, gender parity as it relates to leadership in large corporations? Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by the progress that's being made, but I actually look forward to the day when we don't have to talk about it because, the, you know, there's <laughs> equity on, on this front as well. But to me, I think it, it really starts within our, our company of making sure we have diverse pipelines and diverse development where everybody feels that they do have a path uh, to you know, the most senior positions in the company. And I think in this area, it's incredibly important. There's not a single business that isn't being impacted by STEM. And that's why General Motors and I am personally such an advocate of, of STEM and making sure young women especially don't step off the STEM path in middle school, because I, I think that is a big enabler. So I think it's important for all of us to be creating the pipeline, to be mentoring, and to make sure women have that have that view that, yes, I can be the CEO, and I can do it while raising a family and, and do both well. And so we have work to do, but I'm encouraged, and uh, the number of, of uh, female CEOs that I've had the opportunity to meet and interact with, um, I, I think um, they're incredibly talented. I'm proud to be a member of that group. And I think, you know, as we move forward, it will continue to grow. 
No, that's good to hear. Um, what advice might you have for young women who are listening and who wish to follow in your footsteps? Well, I, you know, I think, that, and I get asked this question a lot, and my advice uh, is, first of all, figure out what you love to do, what you're passionate about, and that, you know, direct your career in that direction, because that's where it's going to be the most rewarding. And personally, I think we'll, where you'll do your best work. And then I, what I learned from my mother, who didn't have the opportunity to go to college, but um, believed in that anything is possible, and that's how she raised me. So I encourage everybody, it, it is possible, but also she taught me work hard. Uh, mm. And hard work um, is is critical to to success. So, uh, the, and the last thing I would say, and, and I especially encourage young women because sometimes they take themselves out of a out of an opportunity before it's really even offered, is is put yourself out there. If you feel a little uncomfortable when you're getting a new opportunity, that's good. You know, lean in. You're going to learn, and and you're going to grow from that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like I should ask the other side of that question. I mean, you have worked in a, a pretty male dominated world, um, uh, particularly at the you know upper echelons of, of corporate America. Uh, what advice do you have for men in terms of encouraging and, and, and you know, uh, you know, helping uh, women succeed? Well, I think it starts with all of us understanding, you know, we all have biases. And so how do we uh, understand those and become aware of them and, and then move forward. You know, one of the things at General Motors, we like to make sure there's a diverse candidate slate for, for our all positions. And I also say, look, if there's not a diverse slate now, um, what are you gonna do in three year, years so we do have one? And so I think it's, it's, it's about setting goals, it's about creating the culture, and it's helping everyone learn um, that how do we create an environment where everybody can be their true self, bring their true self to work, and um, and allow people to grow and flourish. And I, I frankly think that's also a business imperative because uh, people have choices. And if they don't feel they're in a workplace where they're valued and they have opportunity, they're probably gonna look for one where they do. Right. Very well said. Well, Mary Barra, thank you so much for joining us at Signal. Uh, and I hope we can meet in person soon and have you back. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity and we look forward to hosting you at GM. Excellent.